Hello, and welcome to another edition of Espresso Jam's Entrepreneurial Journeys. I have with us today J.D. Gerspine, and he was one of the first persons to make a living consulting on LinkedIn, consulting individuals, business owners like you and me, and his almost 300 recommendations on his LinkedIn profile is proof to how he's helped. And this is going to be such a fun, informative episode. JD, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. I forgot my espresso, but I'm well caffeinated, I assure you. Well, that's very good. I have my espresso with a, with a white cup today. There you go. Yes, just finished that. It, it helps, helps things along. <laughs> <laughs> Great. JD, where do you hail from today? I, I hail from the greater Chicago area. I am a, a Chicago born and bred guy, although I, I, I do reside out here in the suburbs and um, Midwest. I have those Midwestern sensibilities, Joe. Mid- Midwestern and sensibilities. Hey, supposedly. you know, I was in the Chicago area myself for a while in Evanston. Well, I grew up in Wilmette, which is the bordering community. So right there, yes. Lived in the city, met my wife, did the typical pattern of living in there in the city for a while, loved it, moved out to the suburbs, had kids. Now we're in the empty nest conversation, looking to maybe go back into the city. You know how these things work. <laughs> it's a cycle of life, my friend. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. And it it is really uh, an honor to have you here on the show. I know you've been working with LinkedIn for a long time, and a lot of our listeners have LinkedIn profiles. I would say most of them do. I would hope so by now. You're listening to Espresso Jam, short, concentrated, delicious conversations about business, technology, and entrepreneurship. If you're just starting out on your business adventure or you're a seasoned business professional, I'm sure you'll find value in these short conversations. Espresso Jams is brought to you by Apexable, providing the tools, insights, and transformative structures to help you reach your business summit. I'm your host, Joe Matz. Let's get started. So how... You know, how did this get started, JD? How, where did you come from before you were doing the LinkedIn thing? I look at LinkedIn as a as really uh, the culmination of everything for which I've been trained, Joe. I in undergrad, I studied English as a pre med student. I uh, got my bachelor's in English. I was going the medical school route. It was it was dad's plan, not mine. And I actually did make it into medical school on my third try. Uh, I was groomed to be a physician from an early age. Uh, I got in, I achieved, I didn't have the grades at first, but my persistence and determination and scored uh, pretty well on the MCATs and finally got in on drive. And I, I left medical school a month shy of completing my first year and then went back into academia, got a master's in industrial organizational psychology, and then an MBA in marketing communications. So when I look at my academic background in English and in psychology and in marketing, I was ripe for a career in social media. The problem was social media wasn't around when I got my <laughs> my MBA. So I I plotted along in the marketing field. I started my marketing company in 1989, Owlish Productions back then, moved it to Owlish Communications um, in uh, in reverence for uh, for my study of the owl. And when I met LinkedIn, when I locked eyes with LinkedIn in 2006, it was love at first sight, and I've never shut up about it. So I really have kind of come from the marketing world. At the time, I was writing website copy and internal communications for companies and just transitioned effortlessly and seamlessly to the LinkedIn space and became a LinkedIn consultant within a few weeks of creating my account. Wow. Okay. And your production company or your communications company is yes. Owlish. Yes. How like about an, as, as in like an owl. Where on earth do you get that from? And, and the story goes uh, that I, in junior high school, uh, what folks called middle school today, I was assigned to do a theme project in science and it could be on any topic in science as long as it was science. Hmm. And back in the day, my sister was in a ceramics class and she was doing owl sculptures. And there was a lot of owls, uh, stationary owl figurines uh, in my house. And I decided on the owl and 
I did my thir- my theme paper on the owl. She had entered an owl um, in an art fair and did not win place or show. And she was ready to throw away the owl. She was really upset. And I, I grabbed it, saved it. And that owl sits out of frame right now, but it's over here to the right in a shadow boxed frame. So I've always been into the owl. I, I admire it for its mystic and spiritual qualities. And it's my supposedly my spirit creature or spirit animal, as they say. And when it came time to name my company, I just like the sound of the owlish and the communications. So uh, I went with it. Gut instinct. It worked. It worked. I, and I'm glad it did. It, it does sound nice. And everyone mm-hmm. thinks of the owl as a wise bird. Yes. Wisdom, huh? Yes. Big okay. eyes. Owls I'll have big my, eyes. I'll do my best to live up to that. Yes. And and the round glasses, which I wear as an homage <laughs> to the late, great John Lennon, uh, it just, it, it, it does me proud. It serves me well. Awesome. Very, very awesome. So you started your own business way back in the 80s. Well, I was in my father's marketing business. I was in the, I come okay. from the healthcare world. So I've done, I did a lot of healthcare marketing. My father was one of the most prominent uh, re- medical researchers of his day uh, in biochemistry, in clinical medicine, and was around liver regeneration. And much of what uh, he advanced through his studies still exists. He owns a lot of Google pages posthumously. And uh, he died before the advent of the internet. But I was in healthcare marketing for a long time and, and always did the school work thing. So I was always moving projects forward as I was in school. I did some work with the Chicago Cubs, my beloved baseball team here on the north side of Chicago. And uh, when I was in school, I had an eye toward doing business of some kind. I've, I've always had the entrepreneurial leanings, Joe. So when I, when I got my MBA, nobody was hiring. I tried. Really, I did. But I knew in my heart of hearts, I couldn't work for anyone else other than me. Uh, I'm not a demanding boss, as I've realized through the years. So, but, but I have pushed myself and I have been very driven and I've always been focused on the client, whom, whomever the client is. And when I got to the social media revolution and I saw what was going on, things changed for me the moment I sent my first email. And I realized that I could make a go of advising people teaching them best practices in this, in, in this ecosystem, this online world, this virtual world. And what did that look like? What were some of the things that you, that you taught back in you know, the early days of, of the internet and social media? Well, like everybody else, I was an America Online account and I learned about email and dial up and LAN and all that. Now, I'm not the tech geek. I, I look like I should be, but I assure folks that I'm not. I have a lot of blind spots in my knowledge of, of how the internet platforms do work from a tech point of view. But from uh, an intellectual and emotional side, I, I've helped people acculturate into the online world, which I still do today. A lot of the work I do is, is uh, collaborating and partnering with folks who are very gun shy from a, privacy, a privacy and security standpoint, uh, especially on LinkedIn. And they don't put themselves out there the way that we see a lot of folks do. They're, they're, very, they're very timid, they're very guarded. And I think a lot of what I do uh, on, on the coaching consulting side is to just let them know that they should be taking their place uh, amongst everyone else if they want to get their message across. And these days, as you know, there's a lot of clutter. There's a lot of white noise out there. There's a lot of junk out there. And sure. we have to really be our own little personal pile drivers and get through that and, 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 and get ourselves out there with gusto. Yeah, I think that's so important. You know, when I first started going online and and making posts and and getting out there on video, I was very rigid. I -hmm. felt like that's how I should be is rigid, but that was not me. It's been so much easier, so much more fun, so much more engaging once I relaxed a little bit and decided, you know what, I'm a little bit, you know, different from other people and that's okay. I'm a little bit strange, I'm a little bit weird. And that comes through. Um, Perhaps more on Facebook, where it's more personal than business, mm-hmm. but even on LinkedIn now, I'm I'm starting to loosen up a little bit, Good. And, and it's it's been wonderful. Well, I think we can thank the pandemic for a lot of that autonomy as well. I, I, I think that when we were sheltered in home in March of 2020, and when you think about it back then in 2020, we had the greatest marketing tagline ever conceived. I mean, 2020 clear vision, right? Mm-hmm. 2020 vision. And, and then boom, three months into the decade, 
we get saddled with this with this global health crisis. And what have we learned? What have we learned as we sit here today and tape for you on in uh, April, coming up on April of 2023? So we're three years into this, and ideally, it has changed our our value systems. It's shifted our habits, our mindset. Many people leaned into LinkedIn, some for the very first time, and now saw the urgency to to build a brand or create community and get their content out there. And it has been a veritable free for all out there. So you have seen a loosening of, of mores and people have become a lot more attuned with their vulnerability and, and, and frailty and boy, nothing like a pandemic to illuminate the frailty of mankind. We've, we've all been coping on some level with anxiety and stress and depression and loss and imposter syndrome and comparison bias and all of this uh, that the online world is giving us because it's it's now a generation old. Uh, as we sit here and, and tape our little conversation, LinkedIn is a generation old, 20 years. Yeah, come that's May amazing. 5th. That and is amazing. What have we learned? What Where is this going? It's all still in beta as far as I'm concerned. I, we're, we're learning every day on this thing. And so much has changed. The acceleration of change, of being online, just mm-hmm. increased over the last three years mm-hmm. to ex- exponential proportions. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, you, you talk LinkedIn, you, you listen LinkedIn, you see LinkedIn day in and day out all the time right. with many clients. What are the biggest um, challenges that you're seeing now with people being online? We talked about this uh, before we we turned our microphones hot. And that is at what point does LinkedIn turn the corner for folks and become a transformational vehicle? I can speak of my own personal brand transformation. It, I see the transformative force of, of this platform. Others have yet to see it. And that I think is the biggest challenge is moving from I'm on LinkedIn and I'm not using it effectively to I'm on LinkedIn and I see it as a seamless bridge to opportunities. And I think that's really the key. That's the focus of my work is ushering people into this transformational mindset where when you put the right amount of force into it, and that force is cognitive force, when you do the critical thinking and you show up well, eyes on screen, ready to think your way through scenarios, that's when you start to see the transformational force of LinkedIn. And that's when you can leverage the platform to transform your professional life. And there's tra- transformation, transformational. These are approaching buzzword status with great regularity, especially in the coaching profession. But for me, I am not the same person that showed up to, to LinkedIn in 2006. I am, I am transformed and I have changed as LinkedIn has changed. And it has sparked and catalyzed a lot of my growth as a professional. And I owe a huge debt of gratitude to it. But then again, I've worked it, man. I've, I've, I've put in the time. I've put in the effort, the long hours. I'm, I'm approaching 100,000 hours on this thing. And I'm in the trade. So my work is done with people to empower them on LinkedIn, to enable them on the site. So I'm on the site a lot. I'm, I know how how challenging it can be. I know what it takes to acculturate uh, into the online world. And for most people, it requires maybe too far a leap out of the comfort zone at this point. So we've got to pull back on the throttle and and just give it to them in a way that's commensurate with their personality mm-hmm. and their tolerance for risk. But so, so it's a journey. Of course, it is a journey. It's one of the one of my favorite words. Life and business is a journey and getting online and being effective online is a part of that journey for many people. Would you like to get in front of more of your ideal clients and at the same time, build your brand and create evergreen content? Well, you can do that with podcast guesting. This very moment, you're listening to a podcast that may have been published today or three weeks ago or three years ago in a very real sense. You're engaging with the speakers, hopefully enjoying yourself and learning something new at the same time. And you're getting to know the guests and how they help their clients, their customers, and the problems that they solve. You may even be their ideal client and want to learn more about them and download one of their free resources you can find in the show notes or maybe even become a client of theirs. See, when you're a guest on a podcast, you will enjoy that same kind of engagement 
it is perhaps the easiest, most cost-effective way to get in front of new audiences. Learn how you can be a guest on the right podcast and engage with your ideal clients with the free resources available at gapologist.com. Yeah. And I understand what you say about some people being timid and not getting out there and and they're not sure what to do on LinkedIn. So mm-hmm. if you're talking with someone who they have a LinkedIn profile, they've got 200, 300 people, maybe they're connected to, um, and they're not doing a lot on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. but they feel like they should be doing what what would you suggest? I know it's hard to say w- without getting very particular about the person and everything, but what is something that people could do if they want to up their game on LinkedIn? Well, I'm not the LinkedIn on 10 minutes a day guy, and we are a shortcut crazy society, and we're always looking for a good workaround or hack. And I hate to burst the bubbles out there, but there is no magic bullet. Uh, There is no cookie cutter methodology. The approach is individual. Everybody has to bring their own DNA to it, their own uh, cognitive steam to it. And that's what gets you through each session. If you're looking to accomplish LinkedIn with the least amount of wear and tear on your psyche, it's almost impossible to expect benefit. There are things that you can do. Surgical strikes on LinkedIn are important because we're always checking our fellow professionals. If if they hear of us or we hear of them, where's the first place we're going? Or to LinkedIn to check them out. Absolutely. Yes. And and because of the real time of of in real life networking now, a lot of it is done in front of people. So the business card has become almost obsolete at this stage of the game. So now people have their phones and they're connecting right then and there. There's an immediacy of impact right there. And we can look at someone's LinkedIn profile while they're standing in front of us. If we're in the virtual setting, a little bit different because we're behind the scenes. We're uh, we're just viewing people as maybe we hear them in a breakout room or in a gallery view. And, and maybe we decide to organically connect with them later. But the key is that LinkedIn becomes that bridge to get us from a point A, whatever that is, to a point B, whatever that is. And typically in my world, what I would do is I I implore people not to ever sell anything on LinkedIn. You'll sell more products and services on LinkedIn if you don't sell products and services on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. But you build that infrastructure, that profile that truly speaks to your competencies and capabilities and value proposition. And that's what you lead people to so that when they do get on a Zoom call with you, you don't have to spend a lot of time talking about yourself. They've done their homework. They know who you are. And ideally the conversation flows. Think back to you and I, when we met, we met in a virtual networking setup. We connected, we had a Zoom call. We knew that we had professional synergies worth exploring and I'm here. I'm on your show. And it's, it's It's led to this for me. Yes. That's, that's great. Well, one of the things I've, I've upped my game with is going live on LinkedIn and I don't do a lot of selling. I I almost never sell. I I direct people to my website, Mm -hmm. Um, but not always. Mm -hmm. Am I making a mistake by not always of saying the next step is, or to learn more, go to, am I making a mistake by not doing that all the time? Yeah. The so-called call to action, the clarion call to action. And I'm, I'm less about call to action these days because there there's a, a very loud salesy component to it. And I'm advancing and leading a movement on the non-selling sales approach to LinkedIn, because I think that organic growth is where it's at. And that's what will produce the opportunities for people on LinkedIn. And what do I mean by that? It means not hitting people over the head with a pitch sledgehammer. I mean, we are sold at every turn on LinkedIn and people are set up for it. They anticipate it. They see it coming a mile away at this point, especially on the invitation to connect, which is the most egregious breach of ethics of all on LinkedIn. So if you truly want to leverage this platform and break the plane and and get into a sales conversation, if all goes well, it really does implore you to focus on the relationship. Focus on the relationship. Focus on the relationship. Get Build trust, establish rapport. I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know, but the problem is they default to these salesy behaviors and they look like sales predators out there. 
and, and granted, there's a lot of survival and desperation going on out there. People need to sell <laughs> products and services. I understand that, but it ain't happening sight unseen. Nobody. No, my, I, I kind of thought if, if I get out there and provide value, if I provide value in a two minute or the three minute live video, yeah. um, people, if people want to know more, they know how to get in touch with me. They, it's on my profile. They saw me. They they can get on LinkedIn and yes. contact me if they want to or connect with me. Yes. And the moment you say to someone that I offer a 30 minute, no pressure, no obligation consultation, they know that there's going to be pressure and obligation and they can feel <laughs> the cell coming already. And they and and somehow you wind up on their off LinkedIn email list. So again, this this predatory sales behavior these spammy automated messages that are churning out by the thousands and tens of thousands. I mean, every day my inbox is flooded with them as I'm sure yours is as well. These are not people who are making any effort to stand out. And unfortunately that's what it's come to. People kind of expect it. They feel it's the norm. So I'm always telling folks, you want to stand out. You want to make a great impression. Don't sell anybody when you first meet them. Yeah. No, provide value. See what you can do to help them at the moment, I think is is a very interesting, and I've had some wonderful conversations with people where it's just like, what's going on? One of the questions I love to ask, JD, and I, I'll ask you to share some questions also, but I love asking, what project do you have going on right now? What are you excited about? I like to use the question, what's keeping you busy these days? Okay. Anything that's open-ended, you don't want to give anybody a chance to make a binary response, like a yes or no. You, you really want to obviously encourage and coax that reply out of them. And I'm an interviewer. I was a broadcaster in high school. I joined my freshman, uh, first day of freshman year, I joined my high school radio station. And that, that started eight years of TV and radio communications that I keep to this day. These skills have always been running in the background. Mm -hmm. And I know how to interview people. And I run my Zoom interviews, my, my, my Zoom calls like interviews. I, I'd rather hear them talk because finally, at some point, they may come back to me and I'll tell them a thing or two as to what I do. But really the focus is on them and making eye contact with my lens as I'm doing here. I'm not really looking at my screen. I'm, I'm, I know how to conduct myself in front of the webcam. And I think that's what we've also learned in three years in a pandemic is, is how to bring ourselves to a business meeting. Because even yes. though we're not in front of people, there, there's no, you, you don't have the distractions of a busy restaurant with noise and uh, getting up and going to the restroom. I mean, you're in front of your computer, you're, uh, you're in your fishbowl. We've all let people into our homes these past three years or thereabouts. And we, we still are because we're, many of us have settled into the notion of working from home. And if you're in a virtual business, you can work anywhere, correct? Right. It's, so, it's one, of the, one of the silver linings. Yes. of the pandemic is that people became very, much more comfortable with being online. Yes. Yes. Oh, it was, it was a baptism under fire for a lot of people. And yes, they, realize, <laughs> they realize, okay, I better up level here. Um, uh, microphones and webcams were flying off the shelves at Amazon. I remember in the early stages of the pandemic, I paid handsomely for my Logitech Brio and I, I, I was lucky to get it at that price. And now they've come way down and more people, as I've noticed, as the pandemic sailed along and now we're into 2023. And from this point on, there are more people who are getting actively involved in technology. They're improving uh, their audio and video capabilities and, yes. and that has served them well. Yes. And I know you, you mentioned to me, you have a new microphone and, and I have a new well, camera. We're, we're upping the game. <laughs> Well, look, if we're going to, if we expect folks to watch us, we better be sticklers for quality. Yes. At, yes. At some level, you know, you, you reminded me of some of the early videos of people online and some of the mistakes that were made and the guy who looked like a cat. And he's like, I'm not a cat. We can continue with the meeting. I just thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Early into the pandemic, there were a lot of snafus that the news caught a hold of and, and uh, they were entertaining to watch. And someday we'll be able to, uh, you know, to recall these with laughter, but, you know, think of the good things that we, that we accomplished. What did we do? We were, everybody was forced out of their comfort zones really. And everybody had to do this. I mean, if you were going to survive in business, whether you were gainfully employed, whether you were an entrepreneur, whether you were a salesperson in the in the eat what you kill world, everything revolved around connecting with people. And we really lost that connectedness. 
and LinkedIn was there to absorb the shock. And Zoom, talk about a company in the right place at the right time. So LinkedIn and in combination with Zoom kept us not just viable, but sustainable mm -hmm. during the, a time when we really needed companionship and attention and a supportive ear. And we saw more, more people confessing their vulnerabilities and seeking support. A lot of support seeking behaviors on LinkedIn. A lot of people just wanted to know they were on the right track. And once they got it, they were empowered. They, their, their self-confidence increased and they could go out there and, and, and be who they wanted to be as a professional. And they were more and people have been nomadic than ever before in business. We've seen people leaving corporate to become entrepreneurs. We've seen a lot of people who didn't want to go back to a physical office. And they said, you know, I'm going to open up that consultancy I've always wanted to do. So yeah. it, it has been a really interesting inflection point in human history. It has been. And where do you see it going from here? I think these habits are ingrained. I, I don't see people breaking free from this soon. I, people have realized the joys of working at home. And if there's a huge virtual component to their business, they will certainly exploit that. Uh, I, I was a body in motion prior to the pandemic. I was a, a, a professional speaker. I was traveling over all over North America. Uh, I had my first uh, transatlantic gigs canceled due to the pandemic, but Again, the wear and tear, the miles, uh, the heavy lifting involved in meeting people, taking commuter trains, uh, getting stuck in traffic in big cities. I, I don't miss the traffic. I, yeah. I, I yeah. can meet more people in the course of a week on Zoom than I could say in a month traveling across oh, yeah. the country. Oh, definitely. And I, you know, I've had a home office since 1985. Mm -hmm. And most of my life I've spent working at home. I, I was a speaker also where I traveled and I was on planes four, five, six times a month sometimes. Yeah. Um, and it was wear and tear. And I loved it at that time. I loved it. I don't think I would love it today. It's a hard uh, life being on the road. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It was exciting. I got to meet new people. I got to see new places, beautiful places in, in Brazil and, and around the world in Italy and Asia. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that again. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a been there, done that. But I love yeah. getting online and talking with people in England or Australia yeah. or or wherever it might be. I, I think it's fantastic. I feel like I'm traveling the world sitting in my chair. And I'll use that term acculturation again. We've really acculturated well with the technology. We, we are much more comfortable than we were in the early days of, of the crisis. And uh, now I, I wouldn't say it's all together behind us, but people are out enjoying themselves. They're back at in real life events um, and in the big cities where there are bigger networks and bigger communities. Uh, I mean, I don't think we use the term super spreader events anymore. And, you know, we're, we're fine until the next variant comes around, I guess. We're between variants at this stage, but mm. we're certainly now more attuned to the fact that something like this could bring us to a screeching halt. And it's good to now set up that architecture, that infrastructure virtually. So God forbid, if it ever happens again, we can meet people where we need to meet them online. And it doesn't seem as much of an, of an abstraction anymore. I, I feel in, in being on, on a side-by-side -side Zoom with you here, like you're in the next room. Uh, so do, and so do I. You're, you're just in the next room. We're, we're just people talking at this point. And that's what's relaxed us. And that's, mm -hmm. that's how we can use LinkedIn to just tremendous transformational advantage because now we have the profiles of the folks we're talking to. Ideally, they've made some upgrades. Well, maybe, maybe not. That's why I'm retained at the level I am. <laughs> but again, getting that brand infrastructure together and making sure people know who you are before you speak with them, as opposed to just, again, ramming a sales pitch down their throat. Uh, you're always going to be better off organically growing. Yes, definitely. And I, I love how you said you're not a 10 minutes a day guy on LinkedIn, that it does take time and it does okay. take effort. Mm -hmm. And it it really does. And I get, uh, you know, it kind of bothers me when I see the people coming up. It's like, build your LinkedIn, you know, get a thousand followers today on LinkedIn or, or you know, make five sales today on LinkedIn. It's, I'm thinking, yeah. you know, what are they really, you know, I, I just, I, I don't identify with it. 
It doesn't convert. It doesn't convert. And as we sit here today, we're also uh, at the forefront of of the of the AI chat GPT conversation. Yes. And it remains to be seen how this technology and these workarounds are going to impact our daily lives on a site like LinkedIn. Because basically the way I'm feeling about it right now, as we sit here and tape, coming up to April, 2023, when all of this stuff is so damn new, is the whole three year authenticity conversation is out the window because our authenticity will be called into question if we use programs like ChatGPT. People are yeah. gonna to wanna to know, hey, did you write that or did a machine write it? Right, right. And automation what? is the antithesis of authenticity. One of the hey, things- 10 I, times I, You know, one of the things I love about podcasting and being a host and being a guest and doing lives on, on LinkedIn and Facebook, wherever that might be, I'm me. I am not an AI person. It, Are this you is sure? Not AI. I'm not. Well, I'm not talking to deep fake Joe. <laughs> I hope not, because I don't know where the real Joe is. If you're doing that, <laughs> it, you know, man, it's scary. I, I really yeah. have to say, it, it's scary, and it's like anything else that's put into human hands. We would love to see folks use this for the greater good, but unfortunately, there are going to be people who find ways to exploit it and put people into danger or compromise uh, intellectual and emotional well-being with this. I, I mean, look, let, let's be real. I, I didn't read Moby Dick the first time it was assigned to me. I used the cliff notes to get through the theme paper. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, nowadays I look at this stuff as like the, the great cliff notes of, of the internet world. If you want a, a, a mm -hmm. 2,500 word white paper, at your fingertips in seconds, okay, spit a few commands into this machine, but there's a process involved and a, and a uniquely human element to creativity that I think right. is in danger here. And I, I don't know what we're gonna see. I mean, it's we're, permeated Major League Baseball. They're gonna have robots calling balls and strikes pretty soon. Yeah, well, I, I have a feeling the authenticity and the human connection is going to take a, another level because it's so easy to automate that. It's so easy to fake that, that the actual real connection yeah. is going to increase in importance. Yeah. And I, that's I, that's what I'm hoping for. And I'll do what I can to work towards that also. I'm rooting for the guys that, that tell you that what you're reading online is automated. I'm rooting for the guys who develop the software to prohibit this kind of thing from going out. And, and, and again, I'm... Everything I've ever done has been original and exemplary. I, I don't borrow. I don't. I don't. I, I don't really pay attention to what others in my trade do. I, I, I look. I don't do full-on competitive intelligence because I don't want my perspective contaminated. Right. I really bring the, my 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 experience, my thought patterns, my my sequence of proteins in, to to the equation, and I'm I put out original work. I'm engaged to write original work. That's how I make my, my livelihood. So I'm not using templates. I'm not using machine generated programs. I, I don't think that's what the receiver wants. The receiver wants to know that this is something coming from the human being that they're engaged with, interacting with. And if they're hiring this person, they're, they're gonna get the human output. They're not right. gonna get machine output. So important. So important. I'm, I'm sure we could talk about AI and the impact that it's had and the impact it possibly will have in the future for a long time to come. But JD, we're yes. coming to the end of our interview here. Time flies when you're having fun. It does. It certainly does. Do you have any any initiatives or any gifts, anything you, you'd like to leave with our audience or could give our audience? I'd like to convey the power of the LinkedIn creator mode. And I currently write a newsletter. We've mentioned LinkedIn Lives. LinkedIn also has been giving creators multiple channels through which to, uh, to, to message others and express themselves. I like the newsletter. I, I think the newsletter catches people where they, where they most want to be. And that is reading something on their own time. And I run a newsletter. I publish a newsletter called the LinkedIn Style Guide. And I'm I'm really trying to assert myself on this level, borrowing from what I've learned in the, in the men's fashion industry about style, human style, uh, the art and science of style. So I think that that's important. Uh, how we present ourselves, our mode of expression. Um, 
our, our, our mannerisms. I, I think that's what's most important these days. Um, so folks can go to my profile and they'll see right in my featured section, the LinkedIn style guide. It's a subscription platform and we have, we are in the subscription economy, the experience economy. Yes. So we want to enroll people. We're all broadcast stations. We're putting out this, we're putting out that we're multiple channel entities right now. We're all media producers now, Joe. So my media, the one that I really like the most out of everything I'm doing is this newsletter. Which, okay. is, which is multimedia capable, and I do video work on it as well. Oh, great. Well, we will have links to that in the show notes. So you can learn more about JD and um, get on that newsletter list and increase your style and your effectiveness on yes. LinkedIn. It's opt-in too, which is another non-intrusive way of, of, of people letting you know that they're truly interested in absorbing your content, as opposed to me just sending folks the link when they least expect it. <laughs> right. Oh, that's great. I love it. Very good. JD, this has been a great conversation. I sure appreciate your time and, and sharing your expertise with my audience. Joe, you rock. I, I, I knew from the moment I met you, you rock. And I'm, I'm happy to be on this recording with you and hope folks love it. Maybe want to replay it. Maybe want to share it. I, I, that won't upset me. It won't upset you either, will it? No problem there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Great. Have a great day. Bye now. Okay. JD, super. Can I wipe this smile off my face? Wipe now? it off. <laughs> super. Well, that that was that was a great conversation. Thanks that went you. well. You know, I noticed I never changed my clock. My clock is I've we went to daylight savings time. So I, I didn't, I just noticed that I'm an hour earlier, but I don't think anybody really cares. Ah, no, by the time this goes live, nobody's going to care. There you go. Yeah. Did, did you think it went well? Was, was it? Yeah, I did. I, I, I think it went well. I think we <laughs> exposed some good things about LinkedIn, about what's, what's happening, where it might be okay. going, that, that kind of stuff. Love the story. Um, yeah. So we wanted to, to position yourself as an expert. And I, I think you did that. Yeah. Well, that, that really has become my origin story. I, it, I, I've probably, since the pandemic started, I've done about a hundred podcasts hmm. and more and more I'm, I'm getting into that origin story because that, that freedom from medical school really was the, the major trigger point for me in life. Yeah. It, it set me on a path that, I mean, had I stayed on to become a doctor, I probably would have been a casualty. Look what's happening in the medical profession right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've got high levels of stress and anxiety and burnout and suicide rates with physicians are now very, very high. A lot of, just a lot of PTSD. Yeah. That's amazing. I was just talking with a nurse here in the neighborhood where someone, someone put on our neighborhood, um, you know, uh, WhatsApp, they're looking yeah. for someone to do injections for their mom. And I said, did you see that? And she's like, I saw it, but I don't have time. I'm yeah. so overwhelmed with my own work. I can't go, you know, I was like, yeah, well, I, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So, but you know, every day, I, I think that I, I tried to answer your questions as, as best I could. I, you know, I, I get asked that question a lot. What advice would I give to someone who, you know, I mean, at this, at this stage, if you, if, if you're a professional of 15, 20, 25 years, and you haven't done anything on LinkedIn, anything really, it's tough. And I'm being approached by these folks and I'm literally helping them set up their profiles from scratch. Wow. I, I mean, imagine that. Imagine like just starting right now. No. I, I mean, it's unconscionable. What were people doing during the pandemic? <laughs> There's the question. <laughs> what the hell? I mean, one of the what first- you, What have you been doing up to now? Come on. I, I mean, I, 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 I love what I do. I can't scale what I do. And I'm, I'm looking at chat GPT to a certain point to maybe, to maybe give me some kind of, of, of leg up, but I, you know, my clients don't want chat GPT profiles. They want to go through my process so that they can get clear on their story. Because when it comes down to it, if they guessed on a podcast like yours, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to have a printout in front of them and read from it. They're going to, they're going to have to deliver extemporaneously. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah. But um, you're a deep thinker on this stuff. I, I, I love the conversational flow we had and um, I'm interested in listening to it, but I'm certainly going to share it. And 
and <laughs> this was definitely one of the good ones. I'd love to go, uh, what I'll do is when you, is it on YouTube like automatically? Like I can get to it right away? Well, what, what I'll do, I'll send you an email after, you know, today you'll get an email from me and then I will put it on YouTube unlisted. Oh, okay. With show notes, with a title and show notes and give you the opportunity to look at that and make sure it's okay. If you and want then, to add anything. And then you'll post anything. it public? Well, you want to add anything, change anything, let me know. Mm -hmm. I'll change it. And then it then it will go public on YouTube and and all the apps and you know all the all the podcast listening apps and all of that. But I do, you know, I, I just think it's fair that I give you a chance to look at the show notes and make sure that that fits, you know, what your expectations. Well, that's very nice of you. I appreciate that. Um, my, uh, what I'd like to do is I, one of the things I learned last year, I learned how to edit my own videos mm. and I can do a really pro job on it. Um, and I would go through it. I'd like to pick out maybe the best clips unless you do that. Um, I don't know if you edit, but I, I think maybe what you would consider a best clip. And I mean, obviously it'll, it'll have, um, I, I will tag you in it, of course, and make, make sure I mention that I was on Espresso Jams, of course. And you're more than welcome to do if, that. If you, you have, if you have, in fact, if you have a, um, a, a high res logo of your show, please, if you wouldn't mind, pass it along to me so I can use that as an asset when I, when I do this on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do. It, it is high risk. Yeah. And I, and I put your picture in there. So make sure I have a, a if you have, yeah, if you have something promoting our show, I think, I think you did, but I, you know, I, I have maybe I, I well, I'll, you know, what I usually do I'm, is use, use a person's LinkedIn profile picture. That's fine. Um, if whatever you have, if you've kind of superseded it or whatever you you're using um, to promote um, the episode, let me know. Cause I'll do it when I do it through my account, obviously it's coming through my account. So it'll get a, a, a a larger swath of, of people who will look at it. So. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I, when I put it on YouTube on that unlisted private link that I'll send you, mm -hmm. the image will be there. Okay, great. The, the image Perfect. will be there. Perfect. If you have any trouble downloading it or, or anything like that, just let me know. Cool. Are you going to um, the Grand Connection thing tomorrow? The I, I am. Okay. So I know, do you know Suzanne Taylor King? No. So Suzanne is the head of the community that Carolyn and Susan are merging with tomorrow for this event. Okay. I've, I've known Susan since the early days of the pandemic. She's Just, fantastic. She'd make a great guest. The idea lab. The idea lab. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. She'd, she'd make a great guest for you. Yeah. And you can tell her I said that. Okay. <laughs> I, I will. I'm doing some work within her community right now. We're talking about doing some LinkedIn programs together. Okay. So. And you, you are a member of the Grand Connection, is that right? I'm a member for a year because I spoke to them in September. She had me to do a program in September. So one of the perks was a, a year membership. Okay. Problem is they, they, they I'm, I'm so damn busy. I mean, yeah. I, I really can't go to everything I'm invited to, but yeah. I, I did go the, to the one recently and then I'm going to the one tomorrow. I'll, I'll okay. be there. Yeah, I focus, you know, I was doing a lot of networking um, and I, I cut out a lot, but the Grand mm -hmm. Connection is one of the ones that I focus on. So letting go of a lot of what I was doing mm -hmm. allows me to focus on just a couple of groups. Okay. And I found that to be very effective. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Well, well my I friend, I'm well. going to have to let you roll because I've got to get ready for a Zoom at the top of the hour. Very good. And get my bio break in. Right, right. Okay. And um, um, thank you, uh, A, for having me. I enjoyed it immensely. B, whatever post-production work you're going to do to get the, uh, I don't know if there's anybody in front of me, but let me know when you're going to drop this episode. Yep, it'll be a few weeks. All right, let me know and tag me on, your, on all posts and I'll engage on them. And um, send me what you can so I can prepare some posts through, through my perspective, through my account. Very good. Very good. Thank you. All right, you. man. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you online tomorrow. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Espresso Jams. If you like what you heard, please subscribe on your preferred channel. Never miss another episode. If you'd like more business tips on technology, entrepreneurship, and doing better, you can find me on LinkedIn at Joe Matz. That's J-O-E. 
M-A-T-Z, or go to my website, apexable.com. That's apex-able.com. I'm your host, Joe Matz, wishing you an awesome day.